Welcome to the 10th and final installment of Breaking Bread, a 10 part series that has explored the shared and disparate experiences of local migrant communities. Since last February, we have shared stories of family, tradition, trauma, and exchange. Each episode has also featured the shared experience of food, hence breaking bread as a guiding metaphor about our cultural traditions and how they have changed over time. Today's session is called Sunday Sauce, an Italian staple, featuring local dentist and excellent chef, Dr. Jack Capodice, or Capodice. <laughs> Before I start the program, I want to share the McLean County Museum of History's land acknowledge statement, which is a formal recognition that respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land. The land we call McLean County is the ancestral land of many native groups, beginning with the Paleo Indians 12,000 years ago, and most recently Algonquin speaking groups, including the Kickapoo, who were forced west from this area in the 1830s. And as always, I want to thank our valuable partners without whom none of this would be possible. Be in Welcoming, which is a coalition of the Immigration Project, Not in Our Town, Not in Our Schools, the West Bloomington Revitalization Project, the Mennonite Church of Normal, and the First United Methodist Church, who work together to create a supportive environment for immigrants across McLean County. We are also partnering with Design Streak Studio at Illinois State University and Heartland Community College, our partners in education. Now back to this afternoon's program. Our host, Dr. Jack Capodice, was born and raised in Bloomington, Illinois. He is a popular dentist in our town with a passion for oral surgery. I'm glad that he's passionate about that, it's important. He began his higher education at Western Illinois University, graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. He then attended Washington University in Missouri to obtain his doctorate in dental medicine in 1986. In 1990, he graduated with his medical degree at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. When he is in his work at work, he enjoys to spend time with his family an avid wine connoisseur and lover of good food, which is going to come across very strongly in this episode, Dr. Capodice loves to host dinners and treat his staff to unforgettable culinary experiences. I also wanna um, give him a shout out for serving um, on the McLean County Dental Society and for being part of the John Scott Health Governing Board and um, among many, many other things. Take it away, Jack, it's all yours. Thanks, Julie. Well, welcome everyone, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, give you some context about uh, Italian and American ethnicity. And you know, it's frequently thought of, of images as uh, pasta and tomato sauce and garlic bread and those straw wrapped bottles of Chianti. Um, but the truth is that the food traditions of immigrants that they brought with them from rural Italy varied as much as the local customs and dialects and regional feast days that were celebrated in the you know hundreds of the old world villages. And it actually took about almost 80, 80 years time uh, for from the time Italian immigrants started arriving in this country until we arrived at this sort of amalgamation of styles that we traditionally think of as Italian American uh, cooking. But the establishment of a Northern Italian presence really began in Chicago in about 1850. And it wasn't until about 1890 that we started seeing the first big waves of Southern Italian and Sicilian immigration. Uh, and then the Italian population peaked and began to decline around 1930. And that's what happened was that uh, people started just, you know, fragmenting and, and, uh, and moving to other parts of the city, the suburbs and whatnot. But the Sicilian and the Southern Italian roots in culinary, uh, culinary, um, just food traditions really became what became ingrained as what we think of as sort of the traditional uh, Italian American food. And historians have now kind of rethought this, uh, this concept of what actually makes up, um, ethnic 
foods really of all sorts. And uh, because I think that people were thinking of themselves as distinct uh, ethnic groups in America, and the truth is that there were very distinct groups even within Italy itself. So in the United States, uh, the different Italian communities that developed, they had very different food habits as well as different customs. Uh, dialects, political allegiances. And, and so to the Sicilian immigrant, uh, the Genovese grocery store owner was just as suspect as the Irish cop as far as a trust standpoint went. But then over the course of about one generation, this seemingly unbridgeable divide uh, between these fragmented Italian groups actually uh, became a lot more cohesive and a lot more congruent. And in Little Italy, like in Boston's North End and, and in uh, San Francisco's North Beach, there, were, uh, there was this amalgamation that happened where large Italian communities came and lived together. And this was really kind of not the case so much in Chicago. There was actually a number of segregated Italian uh, communities that were then eventually destroyed by urban renewal and some people spiked to the suburbs and uh, but then there was really, you know, the one uh, sort of strong little Italy, I think, that many of us think of that was centered around Halstead and Taylor Streets. And that persisted, you know, uh, really quite a bit longer. Um, but as far as the food ways in the old world go, the there was, you know, material hardship and uh, the rural Italian communities where most of the people came from. Um, they were often, you know, food existed as a basic form of social and economic exchange. Uh, laborers were often paid in food. If one of the family's breadwinners died or a uh, famine or a drought, a disease struck a village, starvation was actually a primary concern. And likewise, in prosperous times, food was a means by which people demonstrated their good fortune and paid their respects to God and community. And it became a social glue that bound the members of the community together. Uh, especially in, in their leisure pursuits. So it's impossible to enumerate, you know, the differences in all these uh, sort of food traditions that, that took place in various uh, areas of Italy. And that's, you know, whether, you know, we were talking about areas all over the country, but, but generally speaking, when you think about staple food, uh, in the North, uh, the staple food was polenta or cornmeal and in the south it was pasta. Um, it was much more common for soup uh, to be used in the north and dairy products, uh, milk and especially butter. Those were generally not used much in the south. The, uh, but as time went by um, in the United States, then there was obviously more crossover from those different uh, you know, sort of food traditions that were spread around Italy. But the daily diet in the South consisted of usually spaghetti made from uh, rye and wheat flour, salt and water, crushed tomatoes, cheese uh, that was usually made from sheep or goat's milk, and then uh, vegetables, which, and, and maybe beans, but the vegetables, there was a huge variety of uh, vegetables. Uh, there were greens like savoy cabbage and, and escarole and lettuces and chicory and turnip greens. Those had long growing seasons as though they were frequently used. Um, but in the summertime, they love eggplant and, and peppers and tomatoes and onions and garlic and artichokes, and asparagus and peas, uh, squashes, broccoli, they were common. Uh, turnip roots, carrots and beets um, were actually not deemed fit for human consumption and were usually used for animal fodder, which seems to me that that's Pretty incredible that you know that you would think a carrot or a beet would be not, not fit for human consumption, but I think something that we have to remind ourselves is that the soil and the growing conditions and the type of those vegetables that they had at the time um, probably were not any just barely remotely familiar with the things that we think of today as those. Um, but then another thing that was uh, that was actually something that were generally used is that fruit was, uh, was actually uh, very often served, uh, as was bread and wine with many meals. But bread was something that most uh, home cooks, they didn't have an oven to make bread. And part of this was just the size of the kind of places they lived in and the homes they lived in. But also, there was a scarcity of cooking fuel. Uh, 
Southern Italy does not have a lot of forested area. There's not a lot of wood to stoke ovens. Um, and so the, the long, you know, the, the legend of the long simmered Sunday sauce that we're going to show a demonstration of later is really something that developed a little bit later. In the winter months, uh, people ate things that they had actually dried or salted or preserved in vinegar, pickled, or maybe stored in pork fat that had been rendered during the summer and fall. Fresh meats were rare, um, but dried meats like uh, hams and salamis uh, and sauces, they were actually common. Southern Italy was so hot that seldom were animals slaughtered uh, anytime outside of some maybe December to March. Uh, and then if they were, the family retained, if they were lucky enough to own a pig or a cow, they retained the organ meats and maybe the lesser cuts, the hooves and, uh, and bones, and then sold the rest. Um, so they really didn't have a lot of meat. They ate chicken or fish maybe once a week, unless an animal unexpectedly died, and then, of course, had that uh, meat to use. But the Southern Italians used goats and sheep primarily for their milk sources. Um, they could make the milk into cheese uh, as a means of preservation. Uh, cows were actually seldom present in Southern Italy because the, um, the heat and the dry climate uh, meant that they were, the grazing land was really very meager. It, didn't, it really wouldn't sustain cows grazing. So, so cow's milk was actually something that was reserved for babies or maybe for um, medicinal purposes. Uh, and the same was true, actually, of fresh eggs. That was something that was uh, not, not that common in Southern Italy. But meal patterns started to develop according to family's traditions. Breakfast might consist of a uh, breakfast of bread, fruit, and cheese, perhaps some vegetable soup. Uh, coffee was made from chicory and dried barley. Uh, the people that worked in the fields, which were primarily the men, but, but at harvest time, the women also, uh, they were given snacks of bread and cheese and olives, uh, maybe peppers and ham or sausage and wine every two to three hours. And then at the end of the day, a large communal meal was then prepared, um, supplied by the boss uh, that consisted of many of those other things, along with the staple grain of the area with sauce, green vegetables, uh, bread and wine, and then usually fruit to finish. Families made a point of, uh, in the old country, families made a point of eating together on Sunday and, uh, and a much more formal meal was typically served. And in fact, if there was meat uh, served during the week, that would be the meal that it was served with uh, if it was available. Sweets themselves were really not a feature of uh, old world Italian cooking. In fact, um, I can say this because my mom has since passed away, so I'm not speaking disparagingly ever. The, but she used to, to laugh that the Italian cookies that sometimes my father's sisters would make, uh, they tasted like pressed sawdust with sesame seeds caked to them. And uh, I don't know if anybody's ever had a traditional Italian cookie, but they're really not sweet. And um, that's because sugar was just not really in the Italian diet, really north to south. In fact, Italy had one of the lowest sugar consumption of any country in the in entire Western Europe. But the what was important to, you know, sort of the small village or peasant life was the, how food was eaten and shared. Uh, it was a form of social as well as um, economic capital, and it played a role in many communities. The women, they would uh, share their uh, roles in food making and kinship. Bread baking, for example, was actually not done in the house, like I said earlier. Often the village would have a single oven that would only be stoked uh, once or twice a week. Um, that primarily because there was a lack of uh, fuel to stoke these ovens. But then women from the community would bring their loaves of bread that had been rising and bake them and take them home and, and sometimes share them. The men, for the men, though, the social life of food uh, really took place in the fields with uh, winemaking, slaughtering, harvesting of vegetables. And then there were nightly gatherings in the piazza. I had a, I had a fortunate experience to uh, visit uh, a place, Mondello, Sicily, where my family was from very close by, just a few miles away, uh, with a, a dentist here in town, Gary Johnson, who since he passed away a number of years ago, but his family was also from the same spot. And so he and I went there with his son, another uh, friend of ours, and this little uh, piazza in Mondello, Italy, or excuse me, Mondello, Sicily, uh, people just 
you know, at uh, a little after dinner time, they came out and there were kids playing soccer and there were old people drinking coffee or wine. And uh, the piazza was lined with, um, you know, food stores. Uh, mostly there, there, would be, there would be some bars or cafes and, and uh, maybe a pizza, sort of a pizza store and a butcher and a couple of produce markets and maybe a baker where you get bread or, you know, or uh, maybe some limited number of cookies and pastries, a, a gelato shop. and. And it was really this fun communal uh, environment that really harkened back to what you really felt like you'd been thrown back in time, you know, maybe 100 years or 200 years to see what life was like at that, at that time. The um, religious piece were something that sort of punctuated the uh, uh, excuse me, the agricultural year. Um, Sundays were always considered a day of feast, and, uh, and as were... Uh, certainly Christmas and Easter and the five holy days of obligation in the Catholic calendar. But there were often uh, other regionally and in smaller villages, there were many other days of feast that were sort of declared throughout the year. And it may have been the, that of a patron saint of the area or from a miracle that had occurred nearby. And sometimes neighboring villages would come and join in the celebration. But one of the, um, one of the, traditions that I think probably carried over most in the United States was the Feast of St. Joseph. That's March 19th, and, and that was a very important feast day in old Italy. Um, St. Joseph was a saint thought to have special powers of healing, so whenever a family member was ill um, or injured, the family would pray to the saint of St. Joseph uh, in hopes that the person would uh, get better or recover. And in fact, if they did, then to show and pay their appreciation and homage to St. Joseph, an altar of food would be prepared, and sometimes just once, uh, but depending on the severity of the issue, um, like if someone had a you know a terrible accident or injury or you know had a heart attack and survived or a stroke and came back from it, um, there may be a, a feast of St. Joseph a table that was prepared for years uh, or maybe forever after that. But the table will be built almost like an altar food, all the, any of the fruits or vegetables that were, that were available at the time would be prepared in two or three different ways. There would be bread, there would be meats, seafood if it was available, certainly cheeses. And then from the community, the family would choose uh, three people to represent uh, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, and they would be seated at the table and they would be served a portion of every food on the table. Uh, neighbors and, and uh, friends would be, and family members would be invited and they would partake partake in the feast also. Some of them would be given portions of things to take home with them. And then if there was any food left, uh, the matriarch of the house would, would go to neighbor's doors knocking three times uh, and letting them know that they could come and participate in the feast. Uh, and, and that's the way it went until the food was actually gone. But uh, once Italians became immigrating to the United States, the that was one of the feast days that still really carried through with a high percentage of the first two generations really of, of uh, Italian Americans. So uh, prior to the 1890s, you know, and this is now back to Chicago, there were just a, a few upper and middle uh, northern Italian families uh, that comprised Chicago's uh, Italian community, but then uh, really large number of Southern Italian and Sicilian immigrants, like I mentioned earlier, began to arrive in the United States in about 1890. And they were distributed around the city, but but the largest Italian enclave eventually became, you know, what, what we would probably consider the um, Little Italy, which was which was Halstead and Taylor Streets. And at that time, there was about 15,000 Italian uh, immigrants in that area. And then the Southern immigrants really gathered into um, Type paisans or you know, friend friend groups, uh, those with a sense of kinship to one another, um, and the northern community tended to settle down in different parts of the city. So really, there was a little solidarity among Italians as far as northern and southern goes for the first couple of decades of the 20th century. Uh, but then, as these families sort of became Americanized or changed. Um, one of the things that occurred was that many, many of these immigrants that came from the old country had dreams of coming to the United States, working, saving money, and then returning to the old country and actually buying land that they had previously tilled for others and resuming their uh, Italian way of life in the old country. But um, as this 
ironically, as as these immigrants began to uh, work and earn and become a little bit more comfortable in their uh, in their lifestyle, they actually got used to American excesses. And so, um, being able to get you know raw ingredients or be able to get work for pay uh, and you know reasonable lodging and, and that was something that that really changed their view of what the old country life was like. And and many uh, immigrants, when they went back, if they happened to go back five years later, 15 years later for a visit for a few months, they were sort of um, surprised at how uh, meager that life really was in the old country compared to what they were becoming accustomed to in America. So, so they uh, really had no real option other than to embrace their new identity. And uh, and really this uh, sort of spoils of American abundance is what is what brought, I think, the uh, the broader Italian immigrant community together or in first generation to uh, identify themselves as a single ethnic group, even though, again, many regional dialects and, and traditions had, con- had uh, you know, contributed to that. Um, the preparation of food in the Italian homes, though, especially around holiday times, often mimicked what was done in the old country. And in fact, it was a, it was a tradition that, that many try to continue and carry on. Uh, I have a brother-in-law, Mark Felici, who lives in Connecticut. His family, his father was uh, first-generation Italian, um, Italian-American. And his, they actually still celebrate the Feast of the Seven Fishes. And it's a uh, elaborate uh, seafood and fish meal that is served on Christmas Eve. Uh, there are seven different courses. Um, and then at the end of the meal, everyone stays up and goes to midnight mass. And, and it's a tradition that's been going on for centuries. Um, but then as time went on, uh, initially, when these Italian um, communities and there were several, like I said, small ones in Chicago. They actually continued many of the traditions of the old country. They uh, they would participate in neighborhood winemaking and pig butchering and cheese making and raising chickens. And and this stuff actually ha- happened in um, in yards and cellars of Chicago apartment buildings during the entire first half of the 20th century. So so for a long time, for decades, and uh, the. These were cooperative efforts. Uh, the labor and the material costs of some of the greens were shared. Uh, a live hog at the time was three cents a pound from the Chicago stockyards. Um, you could buy chips from the Sears and Roebuck Company, and chickens were raised in the yard. And then, even though many of these yards were, you know, very small, or in some places where they existed, they were nothing, a little more than a dream. But but any place there was land, they actually cultivated it. So. So there would be a cooperative within a neighborhood that would that would plant gardens in their yards, and then one person on the block or one person or you know in, in, within a two block area or so would keep their yard as a playground for the children. So the children had a place to actually go and uh, you know kick a ball around or or whatever or jump rope, and then the person that preserved their yard as a playground would actually get a share of the um, the proceeds of the gardens and the rest of the in the rest of the neighborhood. Um, but in as in Italy in the United States, this um, with this community pool of resource, people were expected to show appropriate levels of hospitality. Uh, you didn't take advantage of someone else's generosity unless you were uh, willing to extend that yourself. Uh, and if you did, that was a serious threat to your family's uh, social standing. But as this American Italian identity continued, uh, there was this drop off in large scale home production. I mean, wine production was something that uh, that was uh, difficult to do on a large scale. Uh, that same thing with you know, actually ha- holding and slaughtering livestock, you know, in your backyard. And so there became, uh, you know, this gradual shift away from the labor and the apprenticeship of the younger generation, trying to learn some of these uh, techniques and traditions to, you know, uh, specialty food stores and, and already prepared foods, you know, the, 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 the obligation of sharing might be just in the form of, you know, some store-bought pasta or olive oil or uh, cheeses or salamis or that were bought at the local butcher. Um, 
because it just became an easier way um, for people to fulfill their social obligation. But then um, as this occurred, the ingredients became more readily available to things that people were willing to cook. And so sort of the quintessential meal became uh, spaghetti and meatballs. And there was an author that, that uh, actually did a study in 1937. Uh, her name was Anna Zaloha. And anyway, at the time she pulled uh, a whole bunch, I mean, dozens or hundreds of Italian families. And at that time, 100%. 100% of those families were making spaghetti and meatballs at least once a week. So, so that sort of became the quintessential Italian uh, dish and the Italian American identity. And uh, the, even though that really bared no resemblance to any Northern Italian food, uh, I think that it became one of those things that, that we all, you know, associated with, uh, you know, if someone said to you, what's, what's the number one Italian dish? I think people would probably say spaghetti, meatballs, or lasagna, you know, or maybe pizza, but the pizza was a little more of a later development. Uh, but it also, one of the things that happened was that there was a, um, there were more sweets that were incorporated in just because American children liked sweets that other children that were growing up in America had. And then there was also this Americanization of food. I mean, the kids, the kids and the parents wanted to celebrate Thanksgiving like America celebrated. So, you know, roast turkey came in and then top roast seasoned with traditional Italian, uh, you know, seasonings like garlic and oregano or, uh, and, uh, wine. And, and, and so there really became this crossover, uh, you know, food revolution, I would say. And, and that really occurred in my family also. I mean, we, my mother made a chicken soup, but she put tortellini in it and she made pot roast, but she seasoned it a lot of times with garlic and onion and oregano. And, um, and so we had, uh, foods, of course, were not, um, they were not, traditional Italian, uh, but they had some Italian, you know, background and flavors to them. Uh, another change that occurred was uh, in olive oil. I, I mean, initially, olive oil was the essential ingredient of Southern Italian cooking. And, and in fact, local store owners uh, that supplied it had bins of this or barrels, and, and they were obligated to give people samples to try um, prior to selling it. But eventually, there became branded oils, you know, they were sold in bottles. And and, uh, and then also as that, uh, as there was a move away from bulk olive oil sales, uh, you know, people started using vegetable oils, mozzola and things like that, which, you know, obviously don't have near the flavor um, that olive oil had, but that, but they were less expensive. And, um, and by old world standards, the, the Southern Italians, you know, using a, a diet of, of dried pasta, dried beans, olive oil, um, tomato sauce. Uh, they, they had learned uh, bread. They had learned to make, uh, you know, uh, sustainable, you know, sus sustenance type meals, uh, with pretty meager costs, uh, for centuries. And this was another way of a tip on, you know, a tip on sharing costs, even though it may have, uh, not may have, but, but food quality and or taste, I would say, certainly suffered from that. But then anyway, as time goes on, uh, you know, the typical uh, Italian-American food, uh, you know, it sort of evolved from, from largely pasta and seldom meat, to where meat was actually being served two or three days a week, and pasta maybe two or three days a week, and maybe uh, splinter or risotto uh, one day a week. But there were more um, vegetables that were incorporated, there were more sweets that were incorporated, but, but still, it was very common for the families to finish the meal with bread, fruit, wine, and uh, um, salad. So, so that was something that just kind of became a common thread for a long, long time after that. Um, as these traditions continued, uh, girls, of course, they learned to cook Italian recipes and dishes from their mother. But then when they eventually married, the mother-in-law became sort of the mentor of cooking because the the new daughter-in-law was expected to incorporate the recipes of that family so that she could please her husband um, and uh, and have him feel like he was, you know, still being, uh, you know, fed the traditional foods of the family. So I do want to spend a few minutes now talking a little bit about my family. Uh, my 
grandfather, Mariana Capitice, who was born outside of uh, Palermo, Sicily, in a little town called Termini, uh, which is which is coastal. And he first emigrated to the United States in 1899. Uh, he came through Ellis Island. Um, he was seven years old, and he came alone with a supposedly a note in his pocket of the name of the relatives in Cleveland who were going to meet him in New York and take him back to Cleveland. Uh, that apparently did happen. Uh, I'm sure that he was taken care of by uh, some of the women on the boat and transport. And then uh, he returned to Italy and served in the Italian army uh, in that first decade, uh, late in the first decade of, uh, of the 20th century, and then came back to the United States in 1910. And uh, there he briefly stayed in Cleveland and was married to Rosarini. Uh, my grandmother, and then they moved to Chicago where they started a family. Uh, he, it was common for Italians to, to be involved in the produce industry. Uh, they, that was one of the, that was one of the, um, businesses that was, uh, which was largely Italian. And, uh, and this is a picture of their family. As we, uh, as we came to, as he came to Chicago area, he started selling lemons. He would buy a box of lemons at the Water Street Market, which is on the south side of the Chicago River. Sometimes it was referred to as the Water Street Market. And, uh, and then he would walk up to more affluent areas, North State Street, North Michigan Avenue, and sell on a street corner for, I don't know what, a few cents or a nickel. I don't know what lemons cost in those days. But he eventually um, saved enough money to actually buy a produce cart. So he had a cart that he actually physically rolled that had a much greater selection of um, fruits and vegetables. And the uh, he managed to save enough money then to buy a truck and move the family to Pontiac. Uh, and they moved to Pontiac, Illinois in about 1919 and started a produce company there. Um, I'm not sure how that decision was made to go to Pontiac, but the at the time the produce arrived by rail or by truck and the problem with uh transportation in those days is that the um in the chicago rail yards the they which were very expensive you know a, a box car of produce or whatever could be lost for days or not accounted for for days and there was very uh primitive refrigeration and a lot of times by the time things got you know, past Joliet and past some of the other stops on the way down to Pontiac, what was left was either in poor quality or had been picked over at the point where it was hard to uh, make a go of it. And my grandfather, uh, he had heard that Bloomington was a growing, thriving community. So he then moved the family down to Bloomington in the middle 1920s and started produce. And uh, at company, the Capitalist and Company Warehouse, which sits in the Fat at Monroe and Center, which is the Fox and Hounds building now, and they uh, used the lower level for their produce uh, company, and the upper levels were leased. Um, one fun sort of story was that uh, apparently one of those upper floors was the, the horse racing bookie uh, organization had the entire floor, and they had a ticker, and they were operating an illegal uh, betting parlor. I think my grandfather just looked the other way. Uh, but anyway, at one point, they got a tip that the feds were getting ready to raid it. And so all of them, all the people on that floor ran over to the Illinois Hotel, which was just half a block away. Uh, and then they called down to the post company and said, they talked to my uncle Nick and told him that they had forgotten the cash box. And could he get up there with a broom and maybe, you know, a couple of, you know, garbage bags, you know, paper bags and act like he was cleaning up and get the cash box out of there. So he did. And my dad went with him. My dad was like 10 years old. My uncle Nick was maybe 25. And they got the cash box and they got to the other hotel. And my dad said that one of the men that operated this illegal betting parlor reached into the cash box and grabbed as many bills as he could with one hand and shoved them in my uncle's pocket. And it ended up being $1,200. And at the time, my uncle was working for $15 a week, you know, for my grandfather. And so it's about a year and a half salary. So, so I know it doesn't show our family in a very good light. But, and, I think I got the facts of that right. My dad got a ten dollar bill, and he said he was the richest kid, you know, in school for a year or two. So that that money lasted for years. He bought candy with it, and sometimes you know, maybe a soda, or, you know, an ice cream or something like that. But um, so that's where that the uh, business stayed until it moved later 
to South Madison Street, which is where it was for the rest of its existence. Uh, they bought the old interurban building, which was right next to the railroad tracks, and that actually made for uh, very, very easy access for rail cars uh, full of produce and later frozen foods too, to be able to brought right up to the building and, and unload it and even used as a bank of uh, extra refrigeration. Uh, although they had to pay for each day that the car was parked there, had to pay the railroad. But um, so my my grandparents had nine children, uh, Martin Capodice, who eventually married Ruth, Sarah, uh, who eventually married Guido Natale, and uh, uh, John Natale and Sarah Natale were uh, their children, who eventually became the Baptist. Sarah married Jim Bavister and became the Bavister uh, family. My uncle Nick uh, married Wilma at Capodice. My aunt Anne married Ed Albrecht. My uncle Tony married Jan Capodice. My aunt Vera married Warren Wheeler. And my uh, aunt Marietta married Frank Cox. And my aunt Antoinette married Stan McVeigh. And they actually moved to Texas. He was a state farm agent down there. And then my dad married Betty, my mother, Capodice. So so the fan, this, the families, the Capodices and the Tobbies, the Albrechts, the Wheelers, the Coxes, the McVeighs, and, uh, they were all, you know, the, uh, came from Mariano and Rosa Green. So as, uh, as my, this, uh, slide that I'm showing out just is, uh, it was commissioned by a local artist named Frank Bush. We just decided to have something made for the family that sort of depicted the old produce cart. I don't think it was actually pedal driven, but, but uh, it's something that we are really happy to have and, and feel proud of. Um, and then as the, as the business grew, uh, this move to the old and urban building. Um, proved to be very good because it was just a much bigger building. There was much more available refrigeration. Uh, in, in, in the history of sort of the produce business, the you know, produce originally moved on the water. Um, and, and then produce roll in St. Louis was, was uh, originally on the banks of the Mississippi. Um, in Chicago, the Water Street Market was on the south side again of the Chicago River. And then uh, uh, eventually rail became a little bit more efficient way of moving. You had to remember that back in you know, the 20s and 30s and 40s, the road systems were, there was no interstate road systems. The trucks were more primitive. Uh, I remember my dad saying that the road to St. Louis was a two-lane road and uh, and the trucks went about 40 miles an hour. And so if they had to go to the St. Louis produce market to pick up product, then that was something that was, uh, that was uh, by the time you stopped, the little, you know, stopped at all the stop signs in the little towns. And, uh, you know, it was a five to six hour journey and then a few hours at the market and a five to six hour journey back. So it was really a trek. We think of St. Louis as being close, but boy, it wasn't close in those days by those standards. And, um, the, uh, interestingly on produce row in St. Louis, some of the names of the, the vendors that we de dealt with were, uh, Cusimano, Rini, Picaro, Ceresia, the Montia family, the Rizzo family. And um, the uh, and so it really was, is an illustration of uh, how there were a lot of Italians in the produce industry at that time. Um, the uh, produce in those times also they were they, we didn't have the hybrids that we have now, so their shelf life was much much less. So you know we didn't have tomatoes that you could put on your counter for two weeks, you know, before they rotted. And, and uh, uh, strawberries, if you didn't eat strawberries within two days of getting them, they started to mold. And uh, there was a lot, there's a definite seasonality to the produce that, that, and we did get a lot of produce from local uh, producers, local farmers and that, but in the spring, there would be lettuces and onions and radishes and uh, spring dug potatoes. And in the summer, there'd be berries and tomatoes and sweet, sweet corn and squashes and beans and peaches and nectarines. And then in the fall, of course, uh, apples and tree nuts and grapes for wine making and um, persimmons. Uh, uh, certainly all the fall squashes and, and sweet potatoes and such. And then I always remember we got a few cases of oysters, which were crazy expensive, uh, right at Thanksgiving for people to make oyster dressing. And, and uh, the, not many people bought them. I mean, it was a place like, like Phoenix and Country Club would, you know, or maybe the uh, Illinois Hotel or someplace that, that was, you know, kind of one of the high food spots of the day. Um, in Christ, Christmas time, we actually had Christmas trees for the, for decades, and then they eventually took up too much room in the parking lot too, and they continue to have those. But, but we made fruit baskets that was that's what this uh, 
slide button in front of you is depicting. Um, our our primary um, our primary customers were uh, independent grocery stores, small independent grocery stores like the IGA stores, Mike Mar Mike Market, and others. They were family-owned restaurants. Uh, the Venturas uh, had George Ventura had uh, Venturas restaurant. Uh, Fred Baldini started the Luca Grill, and his sons John and Todd and took it over. And of course, that's been handed down uh, in generations. The Beningo family, Joe Beningo started Beningos, and, and then eventually the Wentworths, which were subsequent generations of the same family, uh, continued to operate that for a long time. Uh, Avanti's, uh, you know, was a little later on the scene, but but really uh, the inst other institutions like schools and nursing homes and that were the primary customer base. Um, through that time, there was actually an American Italian Society that that uh, a lot of these names I just said they were all members of. They had an annual picnic at well in Springs State Park. Hundreds of Italians would, would convene and, and spend the day there. Some would get there on the train, some would actually drive. Uh, and then one last thing I'm going to finish with is that is that winemaking was actually a, still a very vibrant uh, um, option here in McLean County that, that every year uh, in you know maybe October or so or September or October, we would get a train load car of grapes, and most of them were Zinfandel grapes. They're from California, and uh, and that, and then people would buy grapes by the case, and they would make wine at home. And in fact, uh, John Natale still has Guido Natale's wine press. Uh, my dad said they used to make three barrels of wine every other year, so that was that was 100. They were 55 gallon barrels, so 165 gallons of wine would last in two years. And, and uh, my dad said it was, it was always, it was, it was a great year if it didn't turn to vinegar. And he said, but to walk downstairs in that cellar of their home, he said, there were just, just absolutely hordes of gnats. He said, you know, it was just like, you couldn't believe the amount of gnats that would be around there. And I guess we all probably could. But that was one of the side effects of winemaking. If you wanted some wine, and, and my grandfather would keep the glass of wine on the table every night at dinner. Uh, yeah, this is a picture of my father. That it was a from a panograph article that that he gave his insights uh, into what the produce market was like at that time in 1985. Um, and then the uh, another article that ran in the panograph. There's been a number of stories over the years uh, about what we can do to uh, or, you know, what the state of the sort of the local produce market was like at the time. And then eventually we developed into a wholesale food company that was that was uh, really it had not just fresh fruit and produce, but it had institutional foods too, canned goods and frozen foods and dry goods. And, and it was eventually bought by Wa Foods out of Peoria. That was in 1996. My father being the youngest of nine, uh, the they were really just he was 66 years old. He was ready to retire. Uh, the business itself was still a thriving business, but the times were changing and. Uh, um, I think that it was probably an appropriate time to exit that. Uh, it was, but it was a thriving business for 90 years. The uh, this slide is a is a good one just to, to talk about the uh, American Italian. Uh, well, it, it, it says that Capitalist was like the leader of the Italian American Society, but uh, earlier, um, um, well, you can see the upper right the upper right headline says the American Italian picnic. So, I guess which word came first was up to uh, some differences, but but there was a very vibrant uh, Italian community that, that remained uh, cohesive and uh, carried on Italian traditions in McLean County. And then finally, uh, this is a picture of my father on his 90th birthday. That's him sitting in the red, uh, the red sweater. Uh, that his friend is Marty Wheeland. They were born about two weeks apart. Uh, they were friends. Marty Wheeland would be my dentist and probably my inspiration into dentistry. Uh, but they. Um, they were lifelong friends, and uh, I just thought it would be a nice uh, picture to finish with. So really, uh, that's about all I've got. Um, I think we're going to see the video about how to make the sauce here shortly, and, uh, and then I'll be back with some questions. see as this video goes on this cooking demonstration that that there may be some Italian Americans out there that would look at this and say well that's not a traditional ingredient or that's not a traditional ingredient 
But I think that one of the things that's important to recognize is that is that the evolution of what we think of as Italian American cooking is really an amalgamation of several different regional styles. So today we are going to make um, a uh, sort of tr semi-traditional Sunday sauce in Southern Italian cooking. Um, and as what eventually became as Italian American cooking, it was very common for uh, people to have a communal meal, even going back centuries, uh, on Sunday. And one of the cornerstones was usually uh, spaghetti and meatballs. So it was uh, it was a long simmered sauce that was different than the typical tomato sauces uh, that were served during the week, which were very often just uh, very simple crushed tomatoes, maybe some garlic and some olive oil and a little bit of cheese, and that's what was tossed with pasta and then served with bread, and then and then later in the meal maybe fruit and and uh, wine. So to begin our Sunday sauce, which is the long cooked sauce, we start with a pan and a little bit of olive oil in it. Let that get. Get a little bit warm and you know kind of a medium heat and um, most of the components at least of my family's version of this from a meat standpoint were pork related products uh, they were the lesser cuts one of the things that's commonly used was pork neck bones and pig's feet which you'll see we're going to use some of that um, but any kind of bone in pork product like a pork steak or a pork chop is a great start to the base of this sauce because it lends a lot of flavor and as the slow cooking process goes it starts to break up uh, and and add you know it's like little flavor components to the body of the sauce and we're going to just start that in the oil and we add a little bit of a few grains of pepper kosher salt and we'll let that go for a bit and it will get that uh, good and browned on the underside. See if it'll release yet. Not quite yet. Almost. That's a good indication if, uh, if the meat is developing a good, um, what, what chefs refer to as a fond or a caramelization of the meat on the base of the pan. Uh, it'll often release a little bit easier when it's actually ready to turn. Stainless steel pans don't work like nonstick pans, so the, the good news is they're durable as far as stirring things go. They're not so good about having the food release, but we'll see if we can't get those to turn now. So now we're getting a little color on that meat. We're going to repeat our salt and pepper on this side. And we're going to let that go just a little bit longer. So now we add, this is onion and garlic that's been diced. I like to add the dry spices, the basil, the oregano, the fennel seed, the crushed red pepper, and the bay leaves. And I like to let that go for a little period of time to allow those to start releasing some of their aromatic quality. Away we go on that. Now in the meantime, while that's continuing to cook a little, I've gotten this oil just a little hot. This is a spicy Italian sausage. I will put meatballs and sausage in my sauce. I like to use the spicy sausage. It's not that spicy. But then that's sort of the people that are lovers of heat, it can be sort of directed to them. They know they can get a little extra burst if they want by having some of the sausage. Next ingredient into the main sauce, a pig's foot that's been halved. You can see it is mostly just cartilage and fat and tendon and that. And you think, well, how good can that be? Well, we are going to fish this out after this is cooked a while while they're still intact before they fall completely apart because it is a little bit harder to eat the sauce with all the components of this uh, mixed throughout but they will this will add a lot of flavor and it will also add uh, some glycerin <clears throat> and some body to the sauce from all the cartilage in the hook and the idea is just to let the uh, onion and garlic and the dried herbs just kind of cook for a little bit just to kind of take the sharpness out of the onion start start releasing the aromatic qualities of of that we've got our uh, italian sausage browning nicely in the pan We've got our onions and garlic have cooked down just a little bit. So now it's time to add our tomato components. I used crushed tomatoes. 
all purpose, no, no additional seasoning in them. Petite diced tomatoes. I like the petite diced better than the, just the regular diced because the regular diced can have quite a bit of the, the size of them is so big sometimes that it's uh, a little bit much for a single bite. I use tomato juice. I don't use any paste or anything. I like this Knudsen. It's an organic tomato juice. Uh, it's twice as expensive as, as other types of juice, but it's also very good. And, but I also use good old fashioned candles. I don't use the low sodium variety. Uh, I'm sure that's healthier. I gotta tell you, it doesn't taste near as good either though. So, sometimes I'll just pour some of that out and then make sure I shake it again. These juices tend to sell just like orange juice does. You wanna make sure you get all those tomato solids and sludge that are at the bottom. And that is, give that sausage another little twirl. Many times it's not necessary to put any oil in the pan if the sausage renders enough of its own. This sausage is actually kind of a dry sausage. It doesn't have a real high fat component, so it just browns a little better. So now we're going to give this a little stir. Now comes parsley, a good amount. The olives, again optional. Fresh mushrooms, also again optional. The Parmesan rinds. And we're going to give a few grinds with some black pepper. These mushrooms will float until they start really getting along in their cooking process and then they will just essentially fall into the sauce and become part of the body of the sauce. The mushrooms themselves give up some liquid so the sauce needs to cook down for a while, hence the Sunday sauce regimen of essentially cooking all day. Um, very often when I make this sauce I cook it a good part of one day and then into the next day I'll I'll uh, often make it this time of year or later when it's cool enough outside to use the outdoors as a refrigerator. If you put a big pot of sauce like this in your refrigerator that's hot, um, it will warm up the entire refrigerator. But I like to do it, like I said, I like to do it now when it's 35 degrees overnight. And uh, I just set it outside, I put a, a weight down the lid so animals don't get into it. And, uh, and that ends up being the most effective way. Now people do, you can you can cool it down in an ice bath and then put it in your refrigerator, which is fine, it's just more of a hassle. Uh, this sauce does tend to freeze really well, so there's nothing wrong with making a batch and portioning it out in the containers and, and going ahead and freezing it. Uh, once it's thawed and, uh, and eaten, it's absolutely the same. Uh, I don't think it deteriorates at all, even for months and months. So that is the base of the sauce. I will often, after I've cooked it, I will uh, taste it the next day. Um, I always grate some Italian cheese into the sauce itself. I use Reggiano. I use sharp provolone. And then I usually will use some type of uh, either Pecorino Romano or Locatelli, which is just a sharper form of the same cheese. So these are these two cheeses, the provolone and the parmesan, are actually cow's milk cheeses. The pecorino is actually a sheep's milk cheese. Even though none of those are really from southern Italy, but southern Italy, uh, the, the cheeses were often made for sheep's, sheep's milk and goat milk. Uh, cows were, were really uh, a type of livestock they didn't have a lot of, and it was because of the sparsity of the uh, grazing land, uh, the uh, meagerness of the grasses that grow down there because of the intense heat really didn't lend well for, for uh, cows to, to graze. So these other uh, animals are used more often, uh, raised and used for their milk production for cheese. Uh, we all know that, or many of us know, that Northern Italy and Southern Italy had very different uh, staples with which they cooked with. Northern Italy, uh, rice was a, one of the staples, or polenta, as a base, and in Southern Italy it was pasta. The uh, Northern Italians, tended to use more uh, dairy and eggs and, and maybe even butter in some of their dishes where the southern Italian used very little of that. But southern Italy it was tomatoes and cheese and pasta and bread and maybe some garlic and uh, other aromatics that were available and, uh, and often uh, a very much a vegetable based diet. So 
we've got our sausage that's well browned. We're going to put those in. Now they're, it's not cooked through, so it's not something you would just want to take out of the pan and eat right now. But you know, over the next few hours, as that sauce comes up to temperature and simmers and that, it'll cook that sausage through, and that sausage will lend a lot of flavor to the sauce. Meatballs are also something that is very much a, an evolved recipe uh, based on different families. Um, some people use ground pork, some use ground veal, some use ground beef, some use combinations of that, some use sausage uh, actually in it. And I'll kind of show you my own little version. So I do start with two parts, two parts ground chuck, ground Italian sausage. This is some chopped pepperoncini and green olive. Uh, the pepperoncini, I would say, is non-traditional. The green olive is actually common. Sautéed onion and garlic. Bread crumbs from Italian bread. A chopped mixture of Italian cheese. That's a lot of the same cheese. It is the same cheese as I just showed you. Parsley. Basil. Oregano, a little bit of garlic powder, some egg beaten with a little bit of milk as a binding agent, a fresh ground pepper, and then something I do is I use some of the sauce that we're cooking, and it's okay to put it in there cold, to just moisten. There's no way to do this other than just to get in there and do it. So you're trying to mix all of these ingredients together. And then we just portion it to whatever size you want. Some people like really, really large meatballs. You know, they like a tennis ball size. Some people like, you know, really small ones, more like golf ball size. I use an ice cream scoop, which I have right here. Help getting the size. I just kind of let it be a little bit a little bit over that. I don't work them a lot. This dish that we're making, when they pulled uh, Italian American families in the late 1930s, that that one, now think about this, 100% of the Italian families in the late 30s here in the United States were making spaghetti and meatballs at least one day a week. So that was that was that was the dish. Now there were pastas of other sorts and sauces, you know, there were still tomato based that you know, would bear, you know, in components bear some resemblance to you know what we're just showing you today. But but as far as actually the actual dish, uh, this was it. That was this was the this was the traditional family meal. So the people that have got a lot of energy will fry these in uh, meatballs. Sometimes they'll roll them in breadcrumbs and fry them in an olive oil. They get an awesome crisp exture and they're really good. I usually just put mine in a convection bake oven at a kind of a higher temperature. So this is going in at 370 and we'll let them cook for about 15 or 20 minutes. And so there are the meatballs as they come out of the oven. I did make, I cheated and made another pot of sauce yesterday. So this is just like the cooking channel, we can see what the final product looks like. So here it is. And you can see where this, yeah, this originally started way up here and it's cooked down that far. But then contrast that to where we are here, where you can see this is just a much more raw sauce. It just hasn't had any chance to really cook and, and really develop flavors. So many people cook pasta and the first thing they wanna do is rinse a bunch of water on it, and there is surface starch of those noodles that will actually help the sauce stick to it, and you just rinse that away.
my dad says that his sauce wasn't the same as his mother's sauce. My sauce is definitely not the same as my father's, but, but there's been sort of a building on these, uh, these flavor components and traditions that have become a kind of a fabric of our family's sauce. So um, cook with what you like and uh, you know, try, uh, try a hand at, at making a good traditional Italian um, Sunday sauce. I feel like I can still hear the noises of your beautiful kitchen, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was great. Um, so before I get in, into some, some more specific questions, Chris writes that uh, she used to go to Capodice to get dry ice for Halloween. <laughs> right, true. Yeah, we used to use it back when we didn't, we didn't have refrigerated trucks. We'd use blocks of dry ice in the back of the trucks to kind of help keep them cool in the summer months when we would deliver the produce. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, so Suzanne is wondering about the relationship between the tomato culture and Italian American culture. Um, so she writes that she found that the Spanish brought tomatoes to Europe about 1600. Any background about how tomatoes were adopted by Italians? Southern Italian cooking features tomatoes more. Is that because tomatoes can grow there or other socioeconomic reasons? Um, and, and, you know, by extension, does that mean that primarily Southern Italians settled in McLean County? Well, that's a lot to try and answer. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> well, I guess what I would say is that is that yes, the the tomatoes were brought to Europe, yeah, from South America by the Spaniards, and uh, and they are of course widespread planted in Spain and Italy and France and and uh, you know in Greece. Um, I think that I think the reason they caught on is because they're essentially a weed that you know that continues to produce in hot, dry climates, and uh, and and then of course it's also very flavorful. <laughs> They've got a long growing season, and uh, I did just. I don't have a good explanation of why it became such an important part of the cuisine other than it was a, it was a, a fruit that could be, you know, r readily grown and cultivated uh, and, and lent great flavor to the things that it was used in. Yeah. And, and they, it preserves incredibly well. Sure. That's right. Yeah. Like, cooked down I remember food. being really surprised to hear um, from us that, yeah, that canned tomatoes are actually excellent quality. Yeah, they get, and they've gotten better. I think as time has gone by, I think the consumer demand has has created a, a push towards greater quality. Or at least that there are certain brands you can buy that are significantly better. Uh, one of the points of that, when I showed the Contadina, or excuse me, uh, the Campbell's tomato juice, is that I think their tomato juice is better than everybody's. Uh, other than that, that Knudsen, I said Knudsen, I guess I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but uh, but you know, there's a reason sometimes why things cost a little bit more, and uh, and you can taste the love in those things. Um, have you ever heard of making gravy instead of sauce? Yeah, it's, it's, two, it's two terms for the same thing, I think. Uh, they're just, I think some families or some regional areas, you know, they, they call it gravy, but it's their Sunday sauce. It's still the tomato sauce. So. <laughs> um, Sharon writes that my dad bought grapes from your dad to make his wine. Our basement smelled, had gnats, and our feet and hands were rather reddish. <laughs> now, that was a common, probably a common um, report in those days uh, because it was it was true. I mean, they had open bats for fermentation, and it was the people stomped on the grapes to start the process. And and uh, my dad, he he would still to this day said that they just had hordes of gnats uh, in their in their basement. Um. So we were just speaking of the Coos brothers. Um, Greg is wondering, is it true that tarantulas come in with bananas at your produce company? <laughs> well, there, there, is some, there is some truth to that. There were banana spiders that were, I mean, if you looked at a picture of one alongside a tarantula, it's not, they weren't actually tarantulas, but they were like that size. And, and the, in the old, old days, about the time I was maybe six years old and before, the bananas would come in a large bunch that you literally wrapped your arms around and you hung on hooks in the rooms uh, for them to ripen. But then later on, they came in the boxes mm -hmm. that we all see, you know, at the grocery stores when they're unloading the 40 pound banana boxes. But, but when they were in the big bunches, you know, the, the employees would say, you know, they'd wrap their arms around one of those things and this spider about the size of your hand would, you know, crawl out under their shoulder or something like that. And you can imagine 
Oh, I can tell you, I don't like spiders. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that, that those days were pretty much gone by the time I was lifting banana boxes around. <laughs> oh gosh! Um, something else that you mentioned that I was really interested in uh, was the Feast of Seven Fish. Yeah, that was an elaborate uh, seafood preparation. Uh, it began in Sicily and southern Italy. Yeah, you're not. Uh, and like I said, my my brother-in-law, uh, his family's done it and, his, his whole life. Right, and I'm glad to hear that actually it, there was some origin in Italy. You know, because um, I'm sure many viewers will know this name, Carlo Robustelli, who lived in Bloomington for, for quite a while. Um, he would do a feast of seven fishes every Christmas Eve. And our family would participate happily right. <laughs> for years um, when, when, they, when they lived in town. And, and I, I, you know, I would, I would push him about it because his father was Italian and immigrated here. Um, and, and he, uh, his dad and family had a, a restaurant in New York. So he grew up in the food business, if you will. And I said, so, so is what, what Italian heritage is this? And he said, I think it's more Italian American <laughs> than Italian. Yeah, no, it really, but it was, it, you know, it, it was amazing. Yeah. It began in coastal Italy and Southern coastal Italy and Sicily, really. That's, or that's where my my understanding is is what its origins came from. So, um, well, just a lot of great feedback about the the food and the cooking and the passion around the cooking and um, everybody wants to make sauce. <laughs> and this well, when we when I first published that recipe, when Panagraph first published it, you know, over a decade ago, my daughter, who's now thirty two. She, she calls me up. She's a cottage. She says, well, that's just great, Dad. Now everybody knows how to make this family spaghetti sauce. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I go, what did you expect to do with it? And she said, well, I thought maybe we could win a contest someday or something. With this. Right, right. Like <laughs> and I'm like, nope. Anybody Proprietary, can Dad. Come on. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, right. Do your children still still make um, make the foods? Um, you know, not so much Italian foods. Both of my kids are foodies and and really enjoy preparing and eating great food. Um, they've got their own styles uh, that I would say there's not any real ethnic twist to. I think that they both commented on this video. They they saw it before, of course, tonight and. Um, they commented that they're really, really happy to have that now archived so that they can refer to it. So I think that I expect to see them start making the sauce. I, I hope I get to make it less often now. So I'll just start eating theirs. Right. There you go. That's how it should be. Right. Um, I, I think we're near nearing the end. Um, folks are, are have asked their questions and um, have expressed uh, much appreciation for the program. And uh, since the tenth episode, so Jack, you're really you're at, you're at an important point, right, in our whole series because this is the grand finale. Um, but there's there's a quote that I pulled from one of the articles in in this this spread, and the uh, title is for many members of the Arab Ameri American Di diaspora, Mansaf offers a taste of home. And it's by Diana Abu Jabbar. And she says, cooking became our family's method of speaking with one another, both a way of remembering where we started and a way of asking whom we might still be in this new country. Mansaf may not have begun with rice and the version we eat today may bear little resemblance to its origins, but food is a living repository like families like language, its memory is fluid. And I thought that was an excellent summation. That's very, that's very well said. We're, we're all about, right, at the McLean County Museum of History and, and really trying to showcase the stories of um, community members and the history of migration and how, how incredibly personal and um, philosophical it is and existential. Like it's, it's us, it's who we are. But we're always coming, right? Yeah. 
So thank you so much. I wish everyone a lovely evening. Wonderful. I had a great time and I really learned a lot in this. This has been, I've watched a lot of the other episodes and this is, this is both a terrific program and uh, I'm really, really honored to have participated.